This week's Grim Fairy Tales The Golden Key In the winter time, when deep snow lay on the ground, a poor boy was forced to go out on a sledge to fetch wood. When he had gathered it together and packed it, he wished, as he was so frozen with cold, not to go home at once but to light a fire and warm himself a little. So he scraped away the snow, and as he was thus clearing the ground, he found a tiny gold key. Hereupon he thought that where the key was, the lock must be also, and dug in the ground and found an iron chest. If the key does but fit it, thought he, no doubt there are precious things in that little box. He searched, but no keyhole was there. At last he discovered one, but so small that it was hardly visible. He tried it, and the key fitted it exactly. Then he turned it once round, and now we must wait until he has quite unlocked it and opened the lid and then we shall learn what wonderful things were laying in that box. Sharing Joy and Sorrow There was once a tailor who was a quarrelsome fellow, and his wife, who was good, industrious, and pious, never could please him. Whatever she did, he was not satisfied but grumbled and scolded and knocked her about and beat her. As the authorities at last heard of it, they had him summoned and put in prison in order to make him better. He was kept for a while on bread and water and then set free again. He was forced, however, to promise not to beat his wife any more, but to live with her in peace and share joy and sorrow with her as married people ought to do. All went on well for a time, but then he fell into his old ways, and was surly and quarrelsome. And because he dared not beat her, he would seize her by the hair and tear it out. The woman escaped from him and sprang out into the yard, but he ran after her with his yard measure and scissors and chased her about and threw the yard measure and scissors at her, and whatever else came his way. When he hit her, he laughed, and when he missed her, he stormed and swore. This went on so long that the neighbors came to the wife's assistance. The tailor was again summoned before the magistrates and reminded of his promise. Dear gentlemen, said he, I have kept my word. I have not beaten her, but have shared joy and sorrow with her. How can that be, said the judge, when she continually brings such heavy complaints against you? I have not beaten her, but just because she looks so strange, I wanted to comb her hair with my hand. She, however, got away from me and left me quite spitefully. Then I hurried after her, and in order to bring her back to her duty, I threw it at her as a well-meant admonition, whatever came readily to hand. I have shared joy and sorrow with her also, for whenever I hit her, I was full of joy, and she of sorrow, and if I missed her, then she was joyful and I sorry. The judges were not satisfied with this answer, but gave him the reward he deserved. The Nail A merchant had done good business at the fair. He had sold his wares and lined his money bags with gold and silver. Then he wanted to travel homewards and be in his own house before nightfall. So he packed his trunk with the money on his horse and rode away. At noon he rested in a town 
And when he wanted to go farther, the stable boy brought out his horse and said, A nail is wanting, sir, in the shoe of its left hind foot. Let it be wanting, answered the merchant. The shoe will certainly stay on for the six miles I have still to go. I am in a hurry. In the afternoon, when he once more alighted and had his horse fed, the stable boy went into the room to him and said, Sir, a shoe is missing from your horse's left hind foot. Shall I take him to the blacksmith? Let it still be wanting, answered the man. The horse can very well hold out for the couple of miles which remain. I am in haste. He rode forth, but before long the horse began to limp. It had not limped long before it began to stumble, and it had not stumbled long before it fell down and broke its leg. The merchant was forced to leave the horse where it was and unbuckle the trunk, take it on his back, and go home on foot. And there he did not arrive until quite late at night. And that unlucky nail, said he to himself, has caused all this disaster. Hasten slowly. Tom Thumb There was once a poor peasant who sat in the evening by the hearth and poked the fire, and his wife sat and span. Then said he, How sad is it that we have no children? With us all is so quiet, and in other houses it is noisy and lively. Yes, replied the wife, and sighed. Even if we had only one, and it were quite small, and only as big as a thumb, I should be quite satisfied, and we would still love it with all our hearts. Now it so happened that the woman fell ill, and after seven months gave birth to a child that was perfect in all its limbs but no larger than a thumb. Then said they, It is as we wished it to be, and it shall be our dear child. And because of its size, they called it Tom Thumb. They did not let it want for food, but the child did not grow taller, but remained as it had been at the first. Nevertheless, it looked sensibly out of its eyes, and soon showed itself to be a wise and nimble creature, for everything it did turned out well. One day the peasant was getting ready to go into the forest to cut wood, when he said as if to himself, How I wish that there was anyone who would bring the cart to me. Oh, father, cried Tom Thumb, I will soon bring the cart. Rely on that. It shall be in the forest at the appointed time. The man smiled and said, How can that be done? Thou art far too small to lead the horse by the reins. That's of no consequence, father. If my mother will only harness it, I shall sit on the horse's ear and call out to him how he is to go. Well, answered the man, for once we will try it. When the time came, the mother harnessed the horse and placed Tom Thumb in its ear, and then the little creature cried, Gee up, gee up. Then it went quite properly as if with its master, and the car went the right way into the forest. It so happened that just as he was turning a corner, and the little one was crying, Gee up! Two strange men came towards him. My word, said one of them. What is this? There is a cart coming, and a driver is calling to the horse, and still he is not to be seen. That can't be right, said the other. We will follow the cart and see where it stops. The cart, however, drove right into the forest and exactly to the place where the wood had been cut. When Tom Thumb saw his father, he cried to him, Seest thou, father, here I am with the cart, now take me down. 
The father got hold of the horse with his left hand, and with the right took his little son out of the ear. Tom Thumb sat down quite merrily on a straw, but when the two strange men saw him, they did not know what to say for astonishment. Then one of them took the other aside and said, Hark, the little fellow would make our fortune if we exhibited him in a large town for money. We will buy him. They went to the peasant and said, Sell us the little man. He shall be well treated with us. No, replied the father. He is the apple of my eye, and all the money in the world cannot buy him from me. Tom Thumb, however, when he heard of the bargain, had crept up the folds of his father's coat, placed himself on his shoulder, and whispered in his ear, Father, do give me away. I will soon come back again. Then the father parted with him to the two men for a handsome bit of money. Where's will thou sit? They said to him, Oh, just set me on the rim of your hat and then I can walk backwards and forwards and look at the country and still not fall down. They did as he wished, and when Tom Thumb had taken leave of his father, they went away with him. They walked until it was dusk, and then the little fellow said, Do take me down. I want to come down. The man took his hat off and put the little fellow on the ground by the wayside, and he leapt and crept about a little between the sods, and then he suddenly slipped into a mouse hole, which he had sought out. Good evening, gentlemen. Just go home without me. He cried to them and mocked them. They ran thither and struck their sticks into the mouse hole, but it was all lost labor. Tom Thumb crept still farther in, and as soon as it became quite dark, they were forced to go home with their vexation and their empty purses. When Tom Thumb saw that they were gone, he crept back out of the subterranean passage. It is so dangerous to walk on the ground in the dark, he said. How easily a neck or a leg is broken. Fortunately, he knocked against an empty snail shell. Thank God, said he. In that I can pass the night in safety, and got into it. Not long afterwards, when he was just going to sleep, he heard two men go by, and one of them was saying, How shall we contrive to get a hold of the rich pastor's silver and gold? I could tell thee that, cried Tom Thumb, interrupting them. What was that? said one of the thieves in fright. I heard something speaking. They stood still listening, and Tom Thumb spoke again and said, Take me with you, and I'll help you. But where art thou? Just look on the ground and observe from whence my voice comes, he replied. There the thieves at length found him and lifted him up. Thou little imp, how wilt thou help us? They said. A great deal, said he. I will creep into the pastor's room, through the iron bars, and will reach out to you whatever you want to have. Come then, they said, and we will see what thou canst do. When they got to the pastor's house, Tom Thumb crept into the room but instantly cried out with all his might. Do you want to have everything that is here? The thieves were alarmed and said, But do speak softly so as not to waken anyone. Tom Thumb, however, behaved as if he had not understood this and cried again, What do you want? Do you want to have everything that is here? The cook who slept in the next room heard this and sat up in bed and listened. The thieves, however, had in their fright run some distance away, but at last they took courage and thought, 
This little rascal wants to mock us. They came back and whispered to him. Come, be serious and reach something out to us. Then Tom Thumb again cried as loudly as he could. I really will give you everything. Just put your hands in. The maid who was listening heard this quite distinctly and jumped out of bed and rushed to the door. The thieves took flight and ran as if the wild huntsmen were behind them. But as the maid could not see anything, she went to strike a light. When she came to the place with it, Tom Thumb, unperceived, betook himself to the granary, and the maid, after she had examined every corner and found nothing, lay down in her bed again and believed that after all, she had only been dreaming with open eyes and ears. Tom Thumb had climbed up among the hay and found a beautiful place to sleep in. There he intended to rest until day and then go home again to his parents. But he had other things to go through. Truly, there is much affliction and misery in this world. When day dawned, the maid arose from her bed to feed the cows. Her first walk was into the barn, where she laid hold of an armful of hay, and precisely that very one in which poor Tom Thumb was lying asleep. He, however, was sleeping so soundly that he was aware of nothing and did not wake until he was in the mouth of the cow, who had picked him up with the hay. Ah, oh, heavens! he cried. How have I got into the fooling mill? But he soon discovered where he was. Then it was necessary to be careful not to let himself go between the teeth and be dismembered but he was nevertheless forced to slip down into the stomach with the hay. In this little room, the windows are forgotten, he said, and no sun shines in, neither will a candle be brought. His quarters were especially unpleasing to him, and the worst was more and more hay was always coming in by the door, and the space grew less and less. Then at length in his anguish, he cried as loud as he could, Bring me no more fodder! Bring me no more fodder! The maid was just milking the cow, and when she heard someone speaking, and saw no one, and perceived that it was the same voice that she had heard in the night, she was so terrified that she slipped off her stool and spilt the milk. She ran in great haste to her master and said, Oh, heavens, pastor, the cow has been speaking. Thou art mad, replied the pastor, but he went himself to the buyer to see what was there. Hardly, however, had he set his foot inside when Tom Thumb again cried, Bring no more fodder! Bring no more fodder! Then the pastor himself was alarmed and thought that an evil spirit had gone into the cow and ordered her to be killed. She was killed, but the stomach in which Tom Thumb was, was thrown on the midden. Tom Thumb had great difficulty in working his way. However, he succeeded so far as to get some room. But just as he was going to thrust his head out, a new misfortune occurred. A hungry wolf ran thither and swallowed the whole stomach at one gulp. Tom Thumb did not lose courage. Perhaps, thought he, the wolf will listen to what I have got to say. And he called to him from out of his stomach. Dear wolf, I know of a magnificent feast for thee. Where is it to be had? said the wolf. In such and such a house, thou must creep into it through the kitchen sink and wilt find cakes and bacon and sausages, and as much of them as thou canst eat. And he described to him exactly his father's house. The wolf did not require to be told this twice, squeezed himself in at night through the sink, and ate to his heart's content in the larder. When he had eaten his fill, he wanted to go out again, 
but he had become so big that he could not go out by the same way. Tom Thumb had reckoned on this and now began to make a violent noise in the wolf's body and raged and screamed as loudly as he could. Wilt thou be quiet, said the wolf. Thou will waken up the people. Eh, what? replied the little fellow. Thou hast eaten thy fill, and I will make merry likewise, and began once more to scream with all his strength. At last his father and mother were aroused by it, and ran to the room and looked in through the opening in the door. When they saw that a wolf was inside, they ran away, and the husband fetched his axe, and the wife the scythe. Stay behind, said the man, when they entered the room. When I have given him a blow, if he is not killed by it, thou must cut him down and hew his body into pieces. Then Tom Thumb heard his parents' voices and cried, Dear father, I am here, I am in the wolf's body, said the father, full of joy. Thank God, our dear child has found us again, and bade the woman take away her scythe, that Tom Thumb might not be hurt with it. After that he raised his arm, and struck the wolf such a blow on his head, that he fell down dead. And then they got knives and scissors, and cut his body open, and drew the little fellow forth. Ah, said the father, what sorrow we have gone through for thy sake. Yes, father, I have gone about the world a great deal. Thank heaven, I breathe fresh air again. Where hast thou been then? Ah, father, I have been in a mouse's hole, in a cow's stomach, and then any wolf's. Now I will stay with you. And we will not sell thee again. No, not for all the riches in the world, said his parents. And they embraced and kissed their dear Tom Thumb. They gave him to eat and to drink, and had some new clothes made for him, for his own had been spoiled on his journey.